Uh, my name is Dale Vecchio. I'm a research analyst in the uh, Application Strategy and Governance Group here at Gardner. I cover uh, uh, mainframe modernization as one of the coverage areas that I have. Mainframe modernization covers a lot of, uh, a lot of areas. It is not uncommon as a Gartner analyst in my coverage area to get inquiries from mainframe customers asking whether they should stay or not. Uh, I'm probably the only Gartner analyst you know that has a theme song and it's called Should I Stay or Should I Go? And it's by The Clash. Uh, and the question is not, uh, the question is, is a tale of two cities really. It depends on the size and scale and complexity of the applications. Uh, it's not, uh, we don't recommend that anyone should, we say it is technologically possible to do so. It also depend, it depends on the size, the complexity of the application. Uh, it depends on the openness of the organization to other opportunities to do that. As you can imagine, I speak to a lot of, a lot of clients, some who are considering moving, some who have absolutely already made the move. And the, the questions really boil down to, uh, will I get the same quality of service if I move off the mainframe as if I stay on? Will it run as well? Will it perform as well? Will it be as reliable? Because if all of that stuff was true, people would be less reluctant to move, whether they're driven by cost concerns or whether rather they're, they're driven by concerns over skills availability or just simply the applications are no longer responsive and agile. We get all of these reasons for driving it. But customers want to hear directly from somebody who did it. You know, how long did it take? How much did it cost? Was it worth it? Would you do it again? And so these kind of case studies where customers are willing to come and say what they went through and give you their experiences are really, really valuable. I get a lot of stories in the background, and I can't mention the names during an inquiry. I might tell you about the general nature of the experience and what I've seen, but I can never make the, mention the customer. These are perfect examples where the customer is willing to stand up and talk about it to you about exactly what happened. So I always think it's much, much better uh, if you, well, if you hear from the client than me and me than the vendor. So it's always, uh, it's always good someone who's been through it, they're in production, they've gone through all of the pains, they can tell you where the value proposition was, they can tell you what the cost savings are. So my role today is to try and help moderate any uh, conversation that we may have today if you have any questions both to either Mark or I, we will take them during the course of the day. Um, you know, my presence here is really to talk about and discuss the issues around the market. It's not meant to be here as an endorsement to any of these vendors that are in this room, nor, is it, nor should you conclude that I'm opposed to any of the vendors in this room. But I really want to be able to, to bring sort of some marketing perspective and let Mark uh, at GE Capital give you his specific experiences of going through this effort. So during the course of this, if you have anything, uh, any questions of Mark or of myself, we're happy to have you interrupt the presentation. You don't have to wait to the end or anything like that, okay? So on that, let me turn this over to Cindy. Uh, and if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. introduce risk into your project. Today's discussion is going to be around the rehosting effort that Mark and the GE Capital folks did for their mainframe applications. With rehosting you have lower costs and less um, 
lower cost and less risk involved in the, the particular project that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And in the case of GE Capital, they were actually using the TMAX soft target platform in Unix to rehost the applications from the mainframe. However, before they could do that rehosting, they did need to do some conversion of the applications that were there. That's where the Ateris teams actually came in. The ads online applications and IDMS DC COBOL applications had to make their way to CICS COBOL. The IDMS databases had to make their way to the Oracle databases that ultimately GE Capital was looking to have. So between Ateris and TMAX, we did provide the platform that Mark and his team took their applications to. So Ateris provide the conversion capabilities, database, data, and application side. And TMAX Soft provides the target environment to, to do emulation of CICS COBOL to take care of all of the batch processing. Ateris has been in business for the last 28 years. For the last 20 years, we have done conversion and, and acted in the conversion space. The first 10 years of that actually included many manual conversions from non-relational database technology and the languages that go with it to relational. We provide optimum solutions in three different areas, conversion, re-engineering, and re-hosting. So depending on what you're actually looking to do with your applications, what your future looks like, we have solutions that may be able to address each of those. In our migration process and our transformation practice, we do take you from start to end, assessment, database and data conversion, and the application conversion as well. Our tools that are out there that you may have seen on the show floor or may be looking at, understanding tools can become very valuable. We have our EVE tool suite that provides documentation and understanding, impact analysis. It's a desktop tool that your teams can use for your COBOL applications and for your natural applications, whether they reside on the mainframe or off the mainframe. For conversion, we provide our conversion as a service. We use our DB Shuttle tool suite. It takes care of the application language changes, the database design changes, and also the transition of the data from the existing structure to the relational technology. Our re-engineering tool is called EVE RPM. It is a snap-on to the EVE suite, and RPM stands for Rapid Program Modernization. This is an opportunity to drastically reduce the amount of time you spend doing a re-engineering effort and do a tool-assisted re-engineering effort instead of a manual one. And finally, we have a re-hosting tool just announced this week. It's called ATP. It allows natural applications to be re-hosted to the Windows environment, and that can be almost the lift and shift that the TMAX soft team offers for the COBOL environment. So our benefits are that we do everything with automation. We take full advantage of our automation technology and the practices that go around it. Our solutions are comprehensive. They're low risk. They're fast. We have fixed timelines that go with it. And we're successful in what we do. It's, it's been a great set of years for the last 20 years working with our customers to do conversion strategies. We have been recognized by Gartner last year as a, a cool tool vendor and also by SQL Server Magazine and our partners at Microsoft. We have a skilled team of experts who work not only with mainframe technology that we're coming from, but also the target technology that's in place. So that's a little bit about a terrace working with the conversion side of the, the project you're going to learn about from Mark. TMAXsoft is a partner of ours also and involved in this project, provided the target environment for the GE Capital applications. Executing in Unix, the open frame environment is what was used for both the online and the batch applications as they moved off the mainframe into that Unix environment. TMAXsoft also offers capabilities in SOA and also with middleware products for Tibero, their own RDBMS, for instance. So there are other capabilities that TMAX offers as well. They provide a proven path. Lots of organizations are looking to take the applications they have today and move them to a lower cost, more open environment, providing them with the capabilities of a relational technology as well. You can preserve your business rules, your business investment, and do this lift and shift process with the TMAX team, saving yourselves a lot of money and basically get a, a great return on your investment. In the TMAX environment, your mainframe environment actually has your applications in place today, your 3270 emulation. You might have other languages that 
aren't involved in the GE project, for instance, PL1, that the teams at TMAX Soft can take care and rehost for you as well. On the mainframe side, you have platform dependency and exclusive protocols that we all know are in place. With the TMAX process, they have a rehosting process that they'll actually take you through, taking your applications, your databases, and moving them instead to the Unix platform for execution there and the openness and agility that that provides to you. In that environment, you're using OpenFrame instead of CICS, and you're using OpenFrame also for your batch processing. But everything is more open. It's platform independent, and you can use the standard TCP IP protocols that are out there. TMAX benefits include the proven path. You can definitely lift those applications and move them into the TMAX environment. They will move over there. They will execute there very easily, and they will be high performance. And Mark will share information about that with you. It is a robust platform. There are tools that are available there that you might not have in the mainframe environment. And you can have an architecture that's consistent with your organization with the TMAX soft solution. You also have freedom to make some choices. So if you'd like to go to, to Oracle and, or use an SOA framework, you can do those also with the TMAX suite of tools. And finally, benefits-wise, because the application is moving fully intact, there's no retraining required. There's no expensive time spent to retrain your users and how to use the new application. It will look and perform as it does today. So with that, the vendor part is done. I'd like to introduce Mark Rubel. He is the Executive Director of Application Development at GE Capital and will tell us more about his project and how it worked for him today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. What I'm going to share with you over the next 30 minutes or so is our journey of taking that COBOL IDMS application running on the mainframe, converting it to COBOL running with Oracle on Unix, and not changing that user interface. I want to start off, I want to talk a little bit about what GE Capital is. We are one of the world's largest providers of credit. 2010, we had a net income of $3.3 billion with an asset book of almost $600 billion. We operate in 50 plus countries uh, and we have over 100 million customers. Our business is broken down into two segments, the consumer segment and the commercial segment. The consumer segment provides credit to us as consumers through credit cards or uh, loans, home loans, mortgages, etc. The commercial side of the business, which is where my organization lives, really focuses more on providing capital to companies through either leases or restructuring uh, or real estate. To further set the stage here, I want to talk about the PMS suite of applications. And no, I had absolutely nothing to do with naming it. <laughs> uh, PMS was built in 1987. It was built in-house by GE Capital. It started out as a uh, 20,000 account schedule system, no interfaces, domestic only, um, very, very small. Today, it has four highly customized versions of that system run, that run both our direct and our indirect business, uh, both in the U.S. and globally. It currently has 5 million account schedules in it. It has 382 interfaces. It has 1,700 concurrent users. It processes 3.5 million transactions per day. And the system and suite of applications has 71 million lines of code in it. The reason I highlight this, this is not a small application. We didn't rehost our you know, dining reservation system. This is the sun in the universe of the GE Capital Leasing business. This is a system that if it goes down, we are out of business at a very expensive cost. Okay? We took a big risk here, um, and it took a lot of convincing of senior leadership to do that, um, but in the end, you'll see we were successful in doing it. Before we go into the project, any questions on where we, are, where we were before the project on the mainframe? So, uh, it's about a 900 MIP system. Anybody else? Okay. So, why did we rehost this thing? Yes. Oh, you had another question? Sorry. Yeah. What was the main driver for this? <laughs> Thank you for the segue. <laughs> I'll have to buy you a drink later. Uh, 
So why did we rehost? Why did we go down this path? So the first one, as any of you that have mainframe applications know, the annual run costs are expensive. Some would consider them outrageous. Uh, it's an expensive system to run. Technology skill set risk. It's becoming more increasingly difficult to find people that have COBOL, IDMS, whatever your mainframe skill set is, let alone who want to continue working in that technology. Right? It's, you know, the kids coming out of school don't want to know about COBOL. It's just not attractive from an from a employee standpoint. Although our disaster recovery and high availability was acceptable to the business, there was clearly room for improvement, so we wanted to take advantage of that. <laughs> the motto when I joined this organization was, don't delete anything. We might need it again. And they took that to heart. Nothing was deleted. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that later in the presentation. The rate of change is increasing, not only for GE Capital, but for the financial services space in general. Right? All the new regulations and, and government banking rules and stuff that have to be changed. It, we're constantly changing. However, we're on the mainframe. It's not fast. It's not efficient. I can't change as fast as we need to. And that was another reason. How do we, how do we get the, the rate of change increased? Remember those 382 interfaces I talked about? Not one of them is on the mainframe, on IDMS, or written in COBOL. So their ability to innovate is actually hampered by the fact that I'm on this flat file database. Uh, you got to go to the mainframe. You got to go through a middleware. Uh, conversion, you got to go from EPSIDIC to ASCII, and we're slowing down the rest of our business. PMS is the back end of this business. All the people out there servicing you as customers, they're slow because of me. They can't innovate as fast because of PMS. So we want to change that model. So those were the concerns. That's why we wanted to, to do this. Those are the things we were trying to address. When we went to the users and the business leaders with this project, their biggest concern was, and I think Cindy touched on it, don't change my UI. Don't change my usability. Right? We all know if you run mainframe shops, you have users that have been there for 20-something years. They come in in the morning, and as they're pouring their coffee, they're typing their F keys, and they're, they're doing work. Right? They just know how to do it. They don't even have to look at the screen anymore. We didn't want to lose that productivity. And changing the UI and now telling somebody that pushes F keys for 20 years, here's a mouse. I mean, we would have lost a ton of time. So that was key to... Uh, to going live with this. And then finally, just a standard GE project uh, guideline for us is uh, we need an ROI of less than two years or we, or we typically don't do the project. Okay? So our choices here were rewrite the thing or convert it and rehost it. And as you can see, all of our concerns would have been addressed by either path we took. However, not changing that UI and doing this in two years and getting the ROI out in two years uh, would not have been achievable rewriting it. So we went down the rehost uh, and conversion path. Did you price the cost of We started to, and it got to a certain number, and we said we can stop. And it was just outrageous. And again, the users want their green screens. Right? And uh, that, was, that was difficult to do. Okay. All right. So at Dale's request, I actually wanted to talk about the word rehosting, because we called our project PMS rehosting. And I don't think the modernization industry calls what we did rehosting. That's part of what we did. We did a conversion, and then we rehosted. And so I just want to make sure that as I go through this, it just kind of rolls out of my mouth that it's rehosting. I'm talking about conversion and rehosting when I say that. So I just wanted to make that clear. So this is a high-level overview of the project. Um, we have. Uh, our mainframe application, our IDMS, our ads online. A terrorist came in and did an assessment with their DB shuttle tool that basically inventoried everything we had and came up with, really it let us set the groundwork and, and the game plan for how we were going to do this. After the assessment was complete, uh, a terrorist started to work on the database. Everything is driven from the database in this process. So they created our new Oracle DDLs. There were eight of them. They created the IDMS extract and load programs. These are the programs that we're going to run on the mainframe, pulls the data out and translates it and allows us to load it back into the Oracle database. Once we had that, they handed that off to my team internally in GE. We created the databases, we installed the uh, DDLs, and we started loading data. While we were doing that, Ateris was busy converting the front end of the application. 
they took our CICS, our, our, our sorry, our DC COBOL, and our ADZO screens, dialogues, and made them into BIOS maps. Once they were done with that conversion, they handed that off to the TMAXsoft folks, who then converted it or translated it and rehosted it within the Unix environment within their open frame product. Okay. So again, just a high-level overview. I'm going to go into every one of those phases um, in nauseating detail. So. <laughs> Any questions before I, before I move on? Okay. So we're going to really jump into the project here. Um, we had six phases. You'll see on the next couple slides that timeline across the top. That was our project timeline. Um, not all of that timeline was actually spent working on the project. Other priorities did creep in along the way. Um, so uh, it really didn't take us two years of work. It took two years elapsed. But the, uh, the time frame I'm talking about on that timeline will move with the, and be indicated by the red arrow. So you kind of have an idea of where things were in the process. So we had six phases, not much different than any other normal IT project. Right? We did a proof of concept. We did that assessment I talked about. We did a pilot. We did our build, our tests, and our deploy. Okay. So phase one, proof of concept. Right, TMAXsoft came to us and said, we can take your mainframe app and put it on Unix. And we said, yeah, OK. <laughs> well, so we wanted to really see this work. Right? We, we didn't, I didn't want to see the brochures and you know, wishware and show me that you can actually do this. Um, so we wanted to prove out the technology, see it in action. Um, we spent a very little amount of time, little amount of money. We did, uh, we did this project within a month. We converted a small amount of code. I think we did two database records or five database records. And then really we wanted to see what, that, what is that compile and promote process in the open frame product. Do I need to retrain my entire staff right, to be able to support this application? And what we found from the proof of concept is that the code was structured and well formed, which allowed us to believe that it was easily supportable and maintainable. Um, the IDMS database converted as we expected. There were no surprises there. Uh, the compilation process seemed very straightforward, and, and uh, we weren't really concerned about that. The one thing we did learn is there were some tool sets that, that my staff used, um, like an add C compiler, not available anymore on Unix. So there were some tools that we had to replace those with, uh, and that did require some uh, retraining of my staff, not in the application, which was the critical part that we didn't want to change, but in the tool sets used to support the application. Obviously, we were successful with the pilot, um, so, or the proof of concept, sorry. And we moved on to the assessment. And again, what this assessment is, the terrorist comes in, they use their DB shuttle tool set, they basically inventory and do a full analysis of all of the applications that, we're, that we are converting and rehosting to really understand the complexities within and, and what the makeup is and uh, what the timeline is going to be, et cetera, and really formulate a plan. And I got to be honest with you, I said, why am I paying you to figure out what my application does? I know what my application does. Just ask. <laughs> Wrong. Not even close. We got three major benefits out of this assessment. The first one, reduce scope. Remember that? Don't delete anything. We eliminated a ton of components that are no longer used to the tune of 78%. 71 million lines of code sitting on our mainframe, and we use 16 million. Insane. Absolutely insane. Huge reduction. The second benefit was we were able to make more informed decisions. Right? My app is COBOL, it's IDMS, it's ADZO, and there's some Rex and EasyTreat in there. Wrong. This is an example of one of the hundreds of reports you get coming out of the assessment that a terrorist does. And you can see all the different technologies that we found hiding in our system. Most of which probably weren't used anymore. They were in that other 60-something million lines of code. But we found 27 different code syntaxes, right? Because we really know our system. Those people retired a long time ago. <laughs> Technical plans. We were now able to identify a strategy around the uniqueness that makes PMS PMS versus somebody else's leasing system. Um, the Terrace and TMAXsoft, they do these conversions. But as you can imagine, every one of us and every one of our applications are coded differently with different standards. They act differently. Everybody's got their little gotchas hiding in the closet somewhere. So this process really kind of identified those, brought them to the forefront, so we could assemble plans and a strategy to attack each one of them before we got to, oh my god, this doesn't work. Okay. 
This is the list of what the terrorist calls areas of concentration. These are the things that we found that made us unique. Um, some of them were big, some of them were very small. Every one of them was resolved. Um, but we identified 22 of these things that needed to be addressed before we could move forward, or at least have a plan to address. So my skepticism, why am I paying for this? Probably one of the best things we did in this project. I think this project would have, I won't say it would have failed, but it would have been a lot more difficult had we, in, had we discovered down the road that we converted all this code we didn't need. We found these languages that nobody knows anymore. Um, so it was, it was critical information, reduced the cost, reduced the scope of this project greatly. Okay. Any questions on the assessment before I go on? Okay. So now we had our proof that the technology works. We had our areas of concentration lined up of how we're going to make GE not so unique anymore in their application or at least address those issues. Um, and we still had some skeptics within our senior leadership team. So we, we went one more step and we took those findings from the proof of concept. We took the areas of concentration and we wanted to go deeper. Let's do something a little bit bigger. Um, one of the big differences between the proof of concept and the pilot, proof of concept was done on TMAX soft hardware. The pilot was done for the first time on GE hardware within our network, with our uh, infrastructure. Um, so we wanted to gain that further insight. And then the second real thing we wanted to do here is that user base that is so worried about changing the UI, we wanted to prove to them that it's not going to change. Don't worry. Okay. So this took six months. Um, the code that we built here was reused, whereas the proof of concept was throwaway. Um, we did about approximately 5% of the code base. We made sure we touched on all the technical nuances within our code. Pop-ups on a mainframe, we had them. Right? How does that work in rehosting? Critical path functionality. Right? We process a lot of cash, as you can imagine. And when we can't process cash, one, we don't make any money, and our customers don't get the funding and the credit that they need to do what they're doing. So we wanted to test that process. And then finally, like I said, install OpenFrame on GE hardware and see how it works. Okay. Now obviously, the pilot was successful or I wouldn't be standing here today. Um, and we got the go ahead to move on. Um, before I move, I wanted to show you, this is, these are actual quotes that came from some of the users that we, uh, that we had test this in the pilot phase. And basically the comments were around it looks the same, it feels the same, um, no noticeable difference, which is exactly what we were going for. Um, so we started to get some buy-in from the user base that, all right, these guys really aren't, you know, giving us a story. And one of my favorite stories uh, of the project actually comes from this, uh, this part, and that is uh, one of my systems analysts, and we'll call him Wayne, because that's his name. <laughs> <laughs> He was, he was attempting to help one of our users with a data problem. And he's searching and searching and searching, and he can't find the data. And he's driving himself crazy. And he goes back to the user, hey, can you share your screen again? Show me. Oh, there's the data. Perfect. Great. Let me go back. He still can't find the data. Well, you probably guessed. He, he thought he was on the mainframe. He was in Unix. So my point in sharing that, and I shared the story a million times, even within our own, in our own organization, not only did the users not see a difference, but the guys that built and maintained this thing, they can't see a difference to the point where he wasted three hours of a day looking for something that didn't exist. Okay. I, I love that story. I think it's a, a classic example of, of what we were going for. Okay. So um, I'm going to take a little step back here before we dive back into the project. I, this is not something I'm going to go deep on, uh, but I wanted to make, it, make you aware of it if you are planning or thinking about doing any of these implementations. PMS Calc Cheetah rehosting in the middle, that's our PMS suite of applications. That's the project we're doing. But as we started to build out this project plan and start to think about those 382 interfaces and things like that, we actually ended up with seven sub-projects that all had to be completed in the right timeline in order for us to start testing the actual converted and rehosted application. And these aren't small things. Uh, the, the bubble in the upper right called FLAP, once again, I had nothing to do with naming it, was our pricing, or is our pricing engine. Every deal that goes through PMS gets flapped. 
right? It determines the lease streams. It determines the rental streams, the property tax. There is no deal if we can't price it. It's written in Fortran. How many people on my staff know Fortran? Zero. How many want to learn Fortran? <laughs> Less. The, we, we had to do something with these products because you can't run, as far as we know, Fortran on Unix. And even if you could, I don't want to go there. I can't find the skill set. So we actually did a whole separate conversion of the flat module from Fortran to C. The reason I'm telling you this, that had its own budget, its own project manager, its own development resources, its own vendors, its own project plan, its own rigor, its own toll gating process within GE's PMO. Rehosting is not just rehosting. There are other sub projects, and I just want to make sure that people really understand the full scope before you get into that, because it's it's a big cost changer once you start to realize, oh, that doesn't work over there. Okay, so focus. We have um, we have uh, a bunch of departments, specifically our U.S. tax department, that uses focus extensively. Um, and we're getting off the mainframe. We're not going to convert all the focus stuff. So what we ended up having to do, and this is kind of backwards, but um, this is what the tax group wanted. We had to take our, our code, that, our batch jobs, that create those focus extract files and move them from one part of the mainframe to another. We actually rehosted and converted those jobs, ran those, and FTP'd the focus, converted them back to EBCDIC and then put them back on the mainframe so that the focus guys can pull that stuff back in. Now, since we did that and they saw the bill they're going to get for still using the mainframe, they'll be converting pretty soon. <laughs> okay, they, they, it, we, they didn't have the time, they didn't have the priority, they didn't have the funding to do it at that point. It was probably not the best way to do it, but it facilitated the rest of the project. Yes, I am talking about IT employees. Um, basically, it's, it's what we talked about, or what I talked about earlier about some of the tool sets and, and my team having to um, learn different tool sets to do what they wanted to do. Um, there's also, you know, when you do this conversion, right, your code is changing. So there are tool sets like the data access layer that a terrace provides that your team has to understand what it is, how it works, because when you make a change, you're going to need to change it. So there was that kind of stuff. And Ateris and TMAX both provided that training. Um, it, we, we had people on site for a week. It wasn't a big deal, but that's really what that was, the planning of that and developing that training material with what Ateris already had. But then, but I don't want to know what other companies did. I want training to my application. So that's why it became a project. Um, we basically had to write a training program. Sure. Correct. 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 But now they're looking at a flat file database, and now you got these things called tables, not records, right? Now you got ER diagrams, not a Bachman diagram, right? That kind of stuff. You, you have to retrain the the IT folks. Not a not a big deal, but it was something that that we had to do. Did you, uh, did you emulate the TSO on Unix environment? No, we moved to an IDE, and it's, it's basically TMAX Soft's um, Open Studio products. Um, we did not migrate the TSO ISPF. Because you can't. Yes, you can. There is a way that the developer wouldn't even know that it wasn't TSO ISPF, but if you run that on you. Right. Right. Yeah, we used, we used TMAX Soft's. You're not talking about costs overall. Where, when the executives actually bought into this project, was it the waterproof concept? Or it was really after, after the pilot. So we did we did the proof of concept, and they said, "Okay, we'll pay attention to this." Then we went. Then we did the assessment, which really told us how big was big, and what this thing was estimated to cost. And we did this kind of work to figure out what all these sub projects were going to cost. And then we did the pilot because obviously the number I gave them was not small, and. They said, all right, I want to be really sure this is going to work. That's why we ended up doing a pilot secondary to that. Because you, you did build, you found that you had to do the conversion that, and training that added cost to the project mm -hmm. as well. So you had to go back to them to make sure that you were within the two-year ROI frame. No, but before, before we actually got the official approval to move into the build phase, we knew what, what was in front of us. We had done that analysis 
um, you know, between the assessment and the end of the pilot, we were, you know, as we were looking at stuff going, oh my God, what are we going to do with flap? Right? I mean, we figured that stuff out, right? We, we talked to a terrorist about, okay, you're going to put this data access layer in. Uh, you're going to teach me how, what that is, right? So all that kind of stuff fell in place. So when we went for funding approval, we kind of had a good idea of, one, we could get the, the ROI and, and, two, what the ultimate cost would be. At the end, what would the ROI? Can you share that with us? Um, we, our ROI is probably about 1.8 years as payback. Um, we did. We did. Um, it was, we did it. I mean, we're saving significant money. I don't want to ruin the punchline at the end of the, the end of the bench, but. <laughs> okay. Anybody have anything else before I move on? Okay. So the build process. Pretty straightforward. A terrorist came in, converted our language, all the, all the code, converted the databases, uh, delivered those DDLs, created those extract and load programs. In the meantime, TMAXsoft translated all of our JCL. They translated the entire file system, the vSAM, the GDGs, the sequential files, and then converted everything from EPSIDIC to ASCII. Uh, and then, as well, they were responsible at that point to setting up the environment, configuring OpenFrame to work, showing us how to use OpenStudio to submit batch jobs and things like that. Um, so that was kind of the build process. I didn't spend a big time. You'll notice it wasn't very long. Right. Once you do that pre-work, and that's why I stress that assessment so much, the build is easy. Right? Um, I mean, the automation that the terrorist has for that code is pretty cool. You'll see later I talk about um, the fact that we decided to do a code freeze that a terrorist didn't know why, because literally they could rerun this, the entire code in about three days and reconvert the entire application again. Really cool stuff. Where the event happened? User acceptance testing, okay? Our users told us at the beginning of this, we need eight months to test this thing. And we said, you are crazy. They were, they needed 13 months. <laughs> that timeline is real. We tested the heck out of this thing. Probably in my 15 years in GE, the most detailed test plan for a single system that I have ever seen. We, we did. Um, it, I think a lot of it came back to that skeptical nature. Um, you know, when, when I say here we created 4,800 test scripts and ran them multiple times, they, we ran through them all, everything worked, and they go, I don't believe it, we're going to do it again. And, and so there were, I mean, three, four, five rounds of this testing. And it wasn't easy. I mean, you see, we had 303 business users testing, and at the same time, they got to make money for us, right? They got to service their customers. Um, so I think it wasn't 13 months of testing effort. It was probably more of an elapsed time because people, you know, we didn't have a professional testing organization. These are the super users that are running a test script and in the middle picking up a call to service a customer and then coming back and trying to pick up where they were again. So it was a lot of testing. It was a lot of people. Um, the defects weren't outrageous. I mean, the pie chart kind of breaks it down. It's exactly what I expected. Half the defects are in the online and the batch. The other half were performance, environmental, things like that. No showstoppers, obviously, um, but you know that's why you test. You've got to find those defects and flush them out. You're changing your code. You're converting it. In a rehost, I think this would have been a lot less because it's a lift and shift, right? But we literally changed our code base. Okay. So this is the tickets open per month. And the reason I'm showing you this is uh, probably one of the mistakes we almost made. What I'm going to focus on is the two implementation periods that we had. One, the first one for our direct business, the second one for our indirect business. We were originally, everything's going live at once. Right, which everybody goes, wow, why would you do that? Right, nobody does that. Well, these systems, we have a direct and an indirect, but back in 1987, they were one system, one business. The business is split, they each took a copy of PMS, and the direct side, who leases aircrafts, right, high dollar, low volume, do things one way. Our, direct biz, our indirect business that leases copy machines 
right, low dollar, high volume, have two completely different ways of doing things now. So those systems still shared some code, and we did not want to try to untangle that, run one on the mainframe, and run one on Unix. However, we did decide to split them, and probably one of the best decisions we made during this project. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm telling you that is, here's a blow up of those tickets. The first implementation versus the second implementation. Keep in mind, the second implementation, the indirect side of our system, is 10 times bigger than the direct side. And we had probably more than half, than, uh, less than half the number of tickets or defects open during that user acceptance testing. So one of my, one of my uh, lessons learned that I want to share is, right, and you'll see it later, don't try to do everything at once. It sounds very you know, straightforward, of course. Um, but the knowledge we got from that first implementation from a technical standpoint was huge. And not only that, our user base went, ah, oh, OK, this really does work. They had months to be in the application on the direct side before we went with the indirect side. So in hindsight, one of the best things we ever did. There's a question? No, no, there was no data that was being shared. There were, um, there were copies of the same programs. There were, um, there were interfacing systems that would send data in or pull data out, and we would consolidate stuff before it went out and put an identifier on it, right? This is direct, this is indirect, um, that kind of stuff. So there was no functionality tied together. The business would tell you that they're two completely independent systems. But behind the scenes, there's still some strands of the spider web left. And we, we really didn't want to undo that, but we did. And we were successful. It probably added a month to our project to make sure we did that right. Um, but in the end, I mean, it, it, it really paid off. Okay. So the moral of the story here is don't underestimate that user testing phase. It was, it was a humongous effort. They did a fantastic job both on the IT side and the business side. Um, but it is big. Sure. You didn't talk about performance. So. Come on. I owe you a drink. I'm going to have to take out that credit card tonight. So, performance testing. <laughs> my, fa my favorite part of the project. I saw your present. <laughs> My, my performance testing was actually my favorite part of this project. Why? Because it was the biggest problem we had, and therefore it was the most, uh, the most amazing thing to crack, right? Because we did it. So GE, as a standard architecture for applications, wants two-tier architecture, right, from a, from a disaster standpoint. App tiers, uh, active-active, database, active-passive, connection between the two. Uh, what we went, so we started out with that. We bought eight Sun M5000s because we decided that our non-production and our DR could live in the same environment. In a disaster, we would shrink non-production to almost nothing, and we would run PMS on the, the non-prod boxes. So we wanted the same architecture. Uh, in GE, those are in two different data centers. Um, obviously, from a DR perspective, they would need to be. Um, but what we found is we were unable to get the mainframe performance. Remember, our requirement was same as or better than the mainframe, or we're changing the usability of the application, and therefore we're not going. Okay? Cindy and KJ heard that every day a thousand times. Same or better, same or better. Okay? So what was wrong with the application, right? Why didn't that work? And basically what we found out is IDM, the, our PMS application in IDMS was built to run on the mainframe. It's not built to run in Unix. It's very, very chatty. And not to get too technical, and, and if, if people have questions after um, Cindy or I or KJ, I'd be happy to talk about it. What we found was, because we were in a two-tier architecture, every call we made from the app to the database had overhead. TCP IP overhead out of the app, into the database, out of the database, back to the app. No big deal. It was milliseconds. However, one transaction has 8 million of those. 8 million calls. So 8 million times 1 millisecond is a really slow application. Okay? So it wasn't open frame that was slow. It wasn't the way we converted it. 
it was you're trying to retrofit something that was built for one thing and now use it somewhere else. So, uh, like I said, we had a high number of database calls in the application and a high number of programs executed by a single transaction. Right? We spawn stuff over and over and over again. So what did we do? Basically, our final architecture became a single tier architecture, and the reason we did that was we took the TCP IP overhead out of the way. We're now riding the back plane of that box. It's a big box. Right? It's a Sun M9000. I think we can probably run NASA on those things. Right? Now, I could, we could have gone with 8000s, um, but we would have been at the top of the configuration, and we still have mainframe apps left in GE Capital, so I went with the base 9000 versus the top of the line 8000, so we had basically infinite scalability. Um, in our new environment, we're running 16 quad-core CPUs. We're also not active-active anymore. We're just we're active-passive um, on those boxes. So uh, 16 quad-core CPUs, so across the four there's 128 cores running there, right? These boxes can go to 256, and then you can double them. You can, you can put two in one chassis. So really, we have infinite scalability. It wasn't that much more, so that's why we decided to go that way. There is, and uh, what we found, I don't want to give away again the punchline, but... Um, <laughs> no, actually, you're going to buy him the drink now. <laughs> you're making me go out of order. <laughs> uh, uh, basically, what we found um, with, with everything on there right now in the 9000s, we're at about 10% utilization, which is fantastic. Again, with 16 CPUs, let alone the 64 you can throw in there or whatever it is. Okay. We finally achieved mainframe comparability. Right? And this is the coolest part. You'll like this. Here is real data. This is uh, an entire stream that uh, represents our Cheetah application. And it doesn't really matter what the, what the tasks are because it won't mean much to you guys. But here is the mainframe baseline that we were trying to reach. And up and down the side here, you have transactions in seconds, right? the time it takes to run that transaction. Lofty scale. Right? That's mainframe performance, almost sub-second. So on the two-tier platform, this is what we had. We are in trouble, right? It was ugly. It was really ugly. And again, the main reason, that TCP IP overhead times 8 million calls in one transaction. Okay? The great news, going to the single tier, awesome. Right? So I, I put the slide in again just to kind of show it a little more zoomed in, right? So our scale, same data, but our scale is now not to 10. It's to 3.5. I took out the bad one. So here's our mainframe baseline. And remember, better or sub-second is what our goal was. There's that transaction. It was awesome, right? And all those guys in the architecture group that said, you're never going to get that performance. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. It was awesome, right? I love telling them that. Okay. So really, really good. Um, basically, 100% faster or sub-second. There's not a single transaction that, that is greater than a second now on these 9,000s. Not only that, I think the, the dot over at the end there, the highest one, is like 0.6 seconds. I mean, it's, it's not even close to a second. Um, again, this is just representative of one stream. Um, oh, one other thing I can add to make it even a little better. The mainframe test here was 1,100 concurrent users. The Open frame single tier test was 1,400 users. So it was actually even more users that we compared. So, okay. Performance testing. So, <laughs> I, I want to go back to the previous slide. Sure. Yeah, because I, it's not actually previous to the, the whole architecture. Yeah, right there. So this is the DR that you had. Like yeah, so we, 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 kept, we kept the, the prod, non-prod, Right, same as DR is in the non-prod environment, so we, we replicated the exact same storage. So we bought four M9000s. Okay. Any other questions on that on the performance testing? You get to see this cool graph again. Cindy and I like this graph. Okay, so on to deployments. Our first deployment was in May. That was the direct side of the business. Again, the smaller of the applications. We did both international and domestic at the same time. The go live, uh, the deployment actually took 34 hours. We did it over a weekend. 
Um, you can see the extract and load time was almost half of it. It was 16 hours. We did about 12 hours of what we call smoke testing, and the business came in and revalidated stuff, checked the financials, make sure we tied penny to penny, which we did. Um, and then our, we ran our first batch run. And in the first 72 hours, we only had 29 issues identified. It's pretty cool. Our second implementation, I'm still trying to catch up from sleep on, happened, we went live Monday, three days ago, um, with Vendor, which was 10 times the size again, right? At the end of the day, the business didn't really care about the direct side because it's a small part of our business. The direct side, if something goes wrong there, we're in deep, deep, deep trouble. So again, we did international and domestic. Deployment took 48 hours, uh, and a lot of that really came out of the extract and load. Like I said, a lot more data coming out of that system. Um, than we did. And, you know, I think we had even less issues. Again, we had 14 issues opened um, in the first, uh, wait, no, still, <laughs> have to look at my BlackBerry. <laughs> still only 14 issues. We're still in that first 72 hours. Um, the, uh, I think the biggest testament to the success of these deployments is we went live Monday morning at 7 a.m. I'm here talking to you guys, not home fighting fires. It went well. It went really, really well. Thank you. Thanks. We didn't plan this timing either. Thanks, Dale. <laughs> so, all right, what did, what did we get out of this, right? At the end of the day, we got everything we wanted. Our annual run cost decreased by 66%, right? Our uptime. Our ability to bring an application up in a disaster increased 240%. On the mainframe, disaster, four days to bring that application back up. You're waiting for your loan, right? <laughs> See you in four days. Acceptable, but not optimal. New environment, four hours. It was awesome. Application footprint decreased 78%. Right? Like we saw, talked about from the assessment. Saved a ton of storage costs there, saved complexity, people looking for stuff that doesn't even apply anymore and trying to jam it into production. And then most importantly from my point of view, that platform that now supports the growth and the innovation that the rest of the business wants. Right? All those applications, our Siebel's and, and our, all of our origination applications can now move forward with what they want to do because, hey, I'm in a relational database now. I can do some of the things you need me to do. I can make that data available. Right? Our next steps are going to be Hey, let's SOA enable this thing, right? We're not there yet. We just reco we're just recovering from this one. But um, that's probably the next phase, right? But now we have an ability to do that fairly easily. Okay. Any questions on, uh, on the deployments? Yeah, um, the, the, way our, the way our go live schedule worked um, and... Um, my, my lead project manager on this, Kim, did a, a fantastic job, and we literally laid it out hour by hour. And we knew where the point of no return was, right? There's going to be a point of time where we say go, and whatever happens, we're fighting it on the Unix side now. Um, and that was really after all of that testing, right before our batch, right? Because the data hasn't changed. And we knew by X time, if we had to go back to the mainframe, how long it would take to run the batch and be up within our SLA the next business morning. So we had that on both sides. If we didn't get a go by X time, we got to go back to the mainframe where we're going to impact the business day. You talked about the transaction process with that. What about the batch with the, how long did it take to run this on the mainframe and how long did it take to run it in this bar? Same or better or worse? Um, I would say overall it was the same. Uh, clearly, the, the majority of the jobs ran much, much faster. There's a couple that ran slower, but at the end of the day, we were well within our SLA time those are improvements we're going to take on down the road. They, they weren't necessary to complete the project. So we're, we're well within our SLA. We were well within our SLA on the mainframe. I would, I would say overall they're probably equal. I assume you used Solaris on the MIT. We did. Did you take advantage of the containers? No. No. We, the, we're mainframe guys. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't know a lot of that stuff, right? And, Yes, exactly, exactly, right. So, so this is this is our first foray from at least my organization into into the Unix world. Obviously, we have architects and stuff in G that have done this stuff, but um, no, we we kind of tried to not muddy the waters as much as we could. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, we were approached by a lot of companies, even vendors in the same space, right? Um, as as these guys, Microfocus, right? We actually use Microfocus as tools in uh, for our COBOL compiler, for our COBOL runtime environment. Um, but they have tools that do this stuff too. We we did look. Um, I won't say we did a really good job of looking at everybody. Um, we kind of found something that clearly worked, and we had a window to do it, and we jumped in. Yes. We we went to the we went to the business. Not really, did not come from the CIO. Let's say no, reduce cost or else. No, it actually bubbled up up to the CIO. You had to sell it out. We did, and and more importantly, sell it across to the business. Right, they're the ones that were going to be impacted if we messed up. Yeah, it was good. We did. We did. We did. Thank you. I'll show you. Where, I'll tell you where to send the email. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I may buy buying you a lot more drinks. <laughs> it's a it's a good question. Um, when we first launched this, everybody thought they were going to get laid off. I mean, it's it's natural to think that, right? Oh my God, you're going to Oracle. I don't know Oracle. What we did was we really, the rehosting allowed us to say, guys, you're the COBOL guys, and yeah, do I need you for COBOL? Can I go find somebody else to do COBOL? Yeah, but who else knows how the cash process works? Who else knows how we account for things uh, on, on the lease streams? Who else knows how the pricing engine works? So the fact that we didn't wholesale rewrite this thing into Java or something like that, the IT folks got a sense of, and again, once they saw it in the proof of concept in the pilot, oh, you still need me, right? And that's that. It, it really wasn't an issue after that. So would you recommend, like, for somebody who's embarking on this, to have a very non so close to the game? Yeah, I, I think I, I think as much as the pilot was, uh, and the and even the proof of concept was good for us to see from a technology standpoint. If your business users aren't ready to jump in and they don't understand it and they don't think it's going to work. You're not. Even if you do get it to go, you're not going to be successful. They're going to be pulling against you the whole time. So that stuff, forget the technical aspect of it. Just letting them see that what you're saying is not a bunch of hooey, and letting them feel it was was phenomenal. Um, very few, right? The focus one that somebody asked about before uh, is one of those. Um, there's really not much that's left on the mainframe. Um, we're already in the process of actually, um, we're not really shutting down the mainframe. We're going to shut down a different mainframe box and move people into the LPARs we were in. But um, we're already in the process of, of decommissioning. No, because, I mean, even the stuff that is going back to the mainframe, which, like I said, is very few and far between, it's, it's converting it back to EPSIDIC, and it's, it's, uh, it's just a... It's just a transport, right? It's TCP IP or NDM or, or whatever, whatever flavor you're using. What would happen if you didn't do this? We would have kept spending a lot of money. And eventually, we'd have a skill set problem. Uh, eventually, we would have had to do something because the, the, it's hard to find that skill set. I mean, everybody knows GE uses a ton of, uh, of overseas developers and partners and they don't want to do it either. You know, the kids coming out of school, they don't want to do this stuff. So we had to get away from this. Um, a lot of companies actually choose to do nothing. I think that, yeah, and I think, I think that'll work for a while. But at some point, you're going to do something. You're not going to have a choice. I don't know if you agree with that or not, Dale. <laughs> Uh, I, have, I have one more quick slide that I want to share with you guys, and I know we're running out of time. So let me just run through this quickly. Just lessons learned recommendation, kind of a summary. Um, don't underestimate the amount of testing required. I can't say it enough. Um, don't boil the ocean, right? Like I said, we were going full boat. Got to break it up. It was one of the best decisions we made. Don't allow it to become an IT project. This is a business project. It's their system. They're the users. It's not an upgrade. It's not take the CD and install it. Okay. You've got to get the business on board, and you've got to take them with you the whole way. 
Um, and I think this is something we missed on because we thought it would be more of an IT project than a business project. And clearly 300 testers and 4,800 test scripts, it's, it was much more of a business project. Sizing hardware for example, acceptable performance, it's not precise, it's not perfect. Right? We thought we had it, but how do you translate MIPS to CPUs? And oh, you want Sun CPUs? Well, now you need HP CPU. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to do. Um, we were close, but it's difficult. Code freeze pent up demand, real quick. Neither vendor required us to do this. We chose to do it. I think the jury's still out on whether or not it was a good idea. Good idea for the project. We'll see what happens when I get back to Connecticut. There's a lot of work waiting for us. Um, so, right decision, I still stand by it, uh, but I think it's too early to tell whether it was really the right decision. And then finally, just conversion rehosting requires significant C-level support. You don't have that upper level support uh, from your business leaders, you know. It's an expensive project, it's, it's a time consuming project, it needs to push things out of the way. You've got to have that level of support or you're never going to be successful. And that was all I had. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really late. Really? Yeah. <laughs> no. No. Uh, actually, actually, what we did was the the indirect side, and the reason why it was so late in the project, the indirect side, that smaller piece, is still on those M five thousands. It won't be for long. We didn't have a performance problem there because the volume was so low. When we start, when, once that was implemented and we started putting all of the uh, indirect stuff into that environment, we went, oh my goodness. Right? So at that point we had a scramble. We called in a lot of favors from Oracle, from Sun, from you know, the hardware vendors, from our infrastructure team um, to get that stuff in and configured and clustered and you know, do DR tests and we had to do that very quickly. Um, and that was just, that was just our, our ability to, to move fast. Um, I would have liked to have found that earlier, but we didn't. So our plans going forward are uh, before the end of Q1, we will move the direct side over to the 9000s as well, uh, and then uh, sunset that environment. Yeah. If you had to do over, how would you have earlier? It's a good question. Um, I probably would have, from the beginning, taken both code bases and started to run them uh, at the same time. Uh, but that, that's going to take away time from delivering your first part of that implementation. So I think you've got to manage the expectations there that, hey, it's not going to take us three months to get the first piece in. It's going to take us five months, but it may save us ten months on the other end. Um, so I, that's what I would have done differently. Um, but I, I don't know that that would be an easy sell, but um, probably a worthwhile one. Any other questions? Otherwise, no? Okay, thanks for your time, everybody.